moving forward. Liam making a break for it. Is and a it? definitive victory for Rochester Radioactive. Oh, come back. The Dart Zone Pro Tournament of 2022 has come to a close. A winning team has been crowned and they take home the grand prize of $10,000. And now that there's been some time for everything to settle, I'd like to share some feedback. The good, the bad, and the... Hi everyone, it's Brett, and you're probably wondering how I got this jersey since I didn't actually qualify for the Dart Zone Pro Tournament. Truth is, I stole it so I could make this video. Nah, it's not true. It was actually given to me by the team captain of Nebula, so be sure to check out King of Games on YouTube and tell him thank you for this exclusive jersey. Let's start with a brief overview of the Foam Pro Tour. It's a free-to-play competitive nerf and foam flinging event hosted and owned by Drac, typically closing out the HVZ Invitational End War. The FPT game is primarily based on 5v5 team elimination. They're two to three minute rounds of high intensity play with a limited number of darts per team. The Foam Pro Tour returned in 2022 after an understandable hiatus since 2019. The tournament was officially announced in October 2021, along with four qualifiers. This season, you needed to win first or second place at one of those in order to qualify for the tournament. Dart Zone officially entered the 2022 season as a significant sponsor and basically a co-host of the tournament. This was reflected financially as the first and second place teams from each qualifier took home $1,000 and $500 respectively. And the tournament promised cash prizes of $10,000 for first place, $4,000 for the second place team, and $1,250 for third place. But that sponsorship did come with a few changes. For 2022, the Foam Pro Tour became known as the Dart Zone Pro Tour, and very notably, the tournament itself would be run using only official Dart Zone Pro blasters, provided with magazines and ammo the day of the event. So while you could use your own rule-abiding blasters at any of the four qualifiers, you would not be able to use your own blasters in the tournament if you qualified. So where do I fit into all of this? I've attended a handful of US-based competitive events like in 2019 where I played in the Foam Pro Tour and Ragnar Oktoberfest King of the Hill. I would like to see more of these events in the future, and I believe there's a growing interest worldwide in competition-based nerf or foam flinging or blaster tag or whatever you want to call it. More frequent and well-organized events will help shape the competitive scene and make it easier for new players and teams to join. And I did attend Qualifier 2 of this year's FPT season. I released a vlog on my channel back in early May detailing some of the travels, the prep, the games, and the fun. And let me make sure I've got this point absolutely clear. I'm not affiliated with Dart Zone. They have sent me free products to review, even very recently, and I have spoken with some of their reps in the past, but I have never been financially compensated for my reviews, and my financial interests are in no way tied to theirs. For this tournament, they sent me an influencer box, which had some swag and a brand new DZP Mark III, all with the request that I make a video talking about the upcoming events. I was not required to attend any of said events, and if I did, I would not receive any compensation from Dart Zone for travel, lodging, food, etc. And I wasn't even required to use the Mark III they sent me. Spoiler alert, I did, and that was my decision. Dart Zone did not sponsor me, nor did they provide me with any information about the events that could be considered a competitive advantage. Likewise, I was not involved in planning or executing any part of the 2022 Foam Pro Tour. I registered as a player, and that was it. So please know that these are my opinions as an observer and a participant. My goal here is not to call out anyone directly, but I will frequently be addressing Drac as he has been the spokesperson and head organizer for the Dart Zone Pro Tournament. The Foam Pro Tour is his organization, and the games have been designed and run by him and his team. My comments are intended to be taken in good faith and constructive criticism. I would hope that any game organizer or sponsor is open to feedback that serves to make their event even better than the last. The qualifiers and tournament were officially announced by late October 2021. With that came the official rules, qualifier dates, locations, and FPS caps. It was clearly stated that each event would have a different field lout in terms of cover i.e. number of pieces of cover and placement, and the teams would not know those exact layouts until the day of the event. My initial reaction to the secret field layout was mixed. I think there is some fun to be had, and there's a good team challenge to find the best strategies in the shortest period of time. If you're a procrastinator, this speaks to you on some level. 
This also allowed for adaptability on the organizer's side if fields were different sizes. But on the other hand, every competitive event I've ever attended or seen has had their layout public. This allows for teams to plan, practice, and get good. The field layout also serves to best inform a team's loadouts, so finding out the day of the event is too late if you brought the wrong blasters. I know for some people or teams, this lack of information is enough to not attend. And now looking back, each of the five field layouts were very, very different. I have no clue if these were devised from the start and saw extensive playtesting, or they were cobbled together the night before each respective event. Some are certainly stronger than others, and I can only speak from personal experience of the Q2 layout. I thought that one was fine, but the field was pretty big, so that cover was pretty well spread out. Compare that to Q1, which was very minimal, but also the field was smaller. And then compare that to Q4, which was, oops, it's all sideways. And I guess Q3 was fine. And I guess the tournament was also fine. So while I appreciate the thrill of the unknown field layout, I think going forward they should be made public prior to the event taking place. Does that mean that the qualifiers need to have the exact same cover? Maybe not. Or maybe you could establish two to three layouts and the day of the event you discover which one you're actually playing on. Teams have something to plan for, but there's still some surprises the day of the event. But I think not sharing any information on the field layouts is the wrong way to go. People like to know what they're getting into, and teams that might not have as much time to practice together can at least study together. If competitive is aiming to be a sport, practice plays and strategies are required to make that sport better. I'm thankful that no qualifier was held with zero cover. That's a trend that should continue. Here's a map of all four qualifiers. Q1 was November 21st, 2021 in Sanford, Florida. Q2 was April 23rd, 2022 in Morristown, New Jersey. Q3 was May 14th, 2022 in San Jose, California. And Q4 was July 14th, 2022 in Rochester, New York. This one was a Thursday and the last chance qualifier to the tournament, which took place that Sunday, July 17th. There's an awkward gap between Q1 and Q2, and there really shouldn't be. Qualifier 1, aka Cold War, was announced in early October before the others, but the official rules weren't posted until less than a month before the event. This gave people very limited time to try and prepare or even consider travel plans. And then almost five months later, five months later, the second qualifier took place. I don't think it's unreasonable to say that Q1 should have been held in January or February. That would have more clearly put it in the 2022 season, uh, space it more evenly with the other qualifiers, and provide a little bit more time to refine the rules. Not yet. We'll get to that one. I joke that Q1 is the lost footage because it took me a while to start seeing any legit footage or even the field layout without really digging. Dart Zone posted stories on their Instagram for each event, but those disappear in 24 hours. So it felt like very little public fanfare for the inaugural qualifier. And also kind of funny, about three months after Q1 is when Dart Zone reached out to me and others about their tournament box. They asked that we show it off and get the word out about the upcoming qualifiers and the tournament. But everyone has to start their schedule overview with, you can attend four qualifiers starting with Q1 on November 21st which was over four months ago. I know that many were disappointed that qualifiers didn't take place in X city or X state, but it is hard to map the entire US with just four events. I will concede to the folks in the Midwest because that really was the dead zone that people had to travel from no matter what. It is called the Foam Pro Tour, so I would hope that future events would target different hosting locations. Q2 and Q4, and subsequently the tournament, were held indoors, while Q1 and Q3 were both outdoors. Now I'm biased here, but we'll boldly say that the Q2 indoor soccer field in New Jersey was the best, and there are obvious advantages to having events like these held indoors instead of outdoors but I'm also fairly certain that there's a significant cost differential and scheduling challenges. It would be great to have all these events held indoors in air-conditioned spaces, away from the elements, but it's not the highest priority. As long as the fields are clearly laid out, cover stays in place, and there's enough room for everyone to settle in accordingly, I have no problem with playing in outdoor fields. I call the 2022 Foam Pro Tour a hybrid event because it felt like the qualifiers and the tournament were two separate functions. Now I came to initially accept this hybrid style tournament under the guise of growing pains. Dart Zone is sponsoring the event and giving out some of the largest checks we've ever seen in competitive foam flinging. 
this could be a stepping stone for the future of the sport. Plus, teams can still win money from Dart Zone if they win the qualifiers using their own blasters. Nice. The tournament is now clearly an ad for Dart Zone, but if there's good money behind it and direction, let's see where this goes. Maybe this will lead to a standalone Dart Zone event with just Dart Zone blasters. Well, some were not as enthusiastic about this announcement, and I completely understand why. You're telling me I can use whatever I want within the rule set for any of the four qualifiers, but if my team does well enough, we have to play with downgraded blasters? The rules allow for up to 200 FPS flywheelers and 200 FPS springers. Stock Dart Zone blasters will not shoot that high. Of course, performance isn't everything, so what about quality? and reliability. Well, Dart Zone Pro Blasters aren't bad, at least not all the time, but have you seen the community stuff? People put months into their blaster builds, mods, and upgrades. Sure, some dude like me can take an unmodded Mark III into the field and get 160 FPS, but people love competitive for their loadouts as much as they do the play aspect. It's a time for people to shine, the blaster to shine, and the combination to do some work. Prepping a loadout for this kind of game is very different than casual play. People abuse their blasters, which is why a certain level of testing and game practice goes into them. Having only red MK Dart Zone Pro blasters for the tournament means you'll have to buy some yourself in order to practice with the blaster and find its quirks. And those quirks might be different from the shared models you receive the day of the event. More on the official tournament loadouts later. While provided blasters and darts sounds nice, and is nice, for actual play it is a major change. It breaks what is currently part of the charm of blaster tag and why it meshes so well with the mod community. A celebration of ever-evolving high-performance blasters in the hands of a skilled player who knows how to use them, like the back of their hand. Dart Zone used their sponsorship to have the finals be their blasters only, but I think that breaks the current spirit of the game. I really hope that the Foam Pro Tour can return to a bring-your-own-blaster model for every stage of the competition. You knew it was coming. The big two. Say it with me. Rules and refs. Without clear rules and clear enforcement of those rules, everything falls apart. And with Blaster Tag still being a developing game with different interpretations and different game modes, it cannot be assumed that participants know exactly how to play without an official rule book. When the rules were officially released on the Foam Pro Tour website, most people who read through them had some reasonable questions, myself included. Some of those were, how many blasters can I bring? What's the chronograph process for testing performance? How and when do we register for a qualifier? How many qualifiers can I attend? And basically every question in the book for the top eight tournament. In an attempt to clarify these rules for the good of everyone, a Google Doc titled Dart Zone Pro Tour Questions was started and passed around various Discord groups. About 20 questions were listed and sent to Drac the same day that the announcement video and website rules went live. Good job, everyone. Those questions were responded to on November 18th, which was three days before the first qualifier, which is a little late in my opinion. And statistically speaking, you have not seen this document. These clarifications were not added to the online rules, nor was the FAQ section ever copied over to the website. If you weren't aware of this Google Doc, you had almost no chance of knowing these answers before the first few qualifiers or you eventually found out the day of the event. At each qualifier, after registration, Drac did provide a full rules briefing to all present teams. It was a lot of information in a short amount of time, and some of those rules were being shared for the very first time. These briefings also highlighted inconsistencies between the online rules and the day of rules, and in some cases the briefing still left rules ambiguous. For example, at Q2, we assumed that sideline coaches could not cross the center line because that would be onto the other team's half of the field. This had been the case in the 2019 FPT. This time it was said we could cross the center line. So teams did. And the rule still isn't officially stated on the website. The pregame rules briefing should serve as a reminder for what teams already know. It can serve as a way to ground certain rules for the event, such as, if you go out of bounds, you're out. By the way, here are the boundary lines for today. But I will go as far as to say that it is unprofessional and inappropriate to try and drop new rules or rule changes the day of the event. Teams should be expected to know the game if they are going to play. This also ensures that the hosts and referees 
had time to understand all the rules. And if questions arise, they have the proper knowledge on how to answer them quickly or where to reference them. Even a method of scoring was missing from the rules the day I played in Q2. It had been rumored from Q1, but nothing officially confirmed until the pregame rules briefing at Q2. This specific rule stated that if a live player made physical contact with the opposing team's goal, it was considered a gate capture and awarded that team one point. This scoring method had always been intended for the rules because it allows a team to score even if they run out of ammo. Fortunately, it was added online before Q3, but we had to beg and complain to get that rule in writing. And let's call it like it is. Every qualifier had slightly different rules, and that was very frustrating. Even if it appeared minor, like a difference in rounds being two minutes versus three minutes. Once Q1 had taken place, the rule should have been locked in for the season. Yet right before Q3, a major scoring change took place. One strategy for scoring at Q2 if your team had good cover and more players alive was turtling behind cover and waiting out the clock. If a round ends with not everyone eliminated or a gate is uncaptured, whoever has more players alive gets one point. This wasn't seen in Q1 because the matches went faster, but it was still the rule. The change now was if a round times out, no point is awarded, meaning you have to push for an elimination or gate capture to score. In all honesty, it makes sense and probably should have started that way, but was it appropriate to make this change halfway through the qualifiers? Is that unfair to the people who have already played, or will the remaining qualifiers be a disaster without this fix? I still don't know the answer, but I do know that significant rule changes at this point did not sit well with the players myself included. Another change pertained to AEGs and what category of blaster they fit into for FPS readings. There was one particular blaster that seemed to prompt this, but by the end of the tournament it was certainly not the only one that needed clarifying. AEGs did not come into existence in 2022. Certain foam flinging models just became more widely available. They should not have been ignored when drafting the rules. Even air blasters of any kind are not currently mentioned in the rules. The flywheel rule was ultimately amended to be all battery powered blasters such as AEGs and flywheelers. But once again, it's something that just should not have been missed. But rules are only effective if they are enforced. Let's talk about the referees and most importantly, how every single event did not have enough of them. Now, first, I do want to say thank you to the people who volunteered their time to help ref these events. It's not an easy thing to do, you're underappreciated, and you're probably gonna get yelled at. These kinds of games cannot be held on the honor system alone. While I assume most people take their hits if they are aware of them, the reality of firing foam darts is that many tags are often missed. If anywhere on your body, gear, or blaster counts as a hit, it is incredibly common to not see or feel a tag. Now, if people are blatantly ignoring hits, that's malicious cheating, and that's a separate issue. The refs are present to be an extra pair of eyes that see all angles on the field and enforce the game rules. They watch for false starts, stepping out of bounds, scoring, and of course, tags. Aside from a player calling themselves hit in good faith, only a ref can officially call a player on the field tagged out. And these games are elimination based, so those calls matter more than ever. The field I played on for Q2 was bigger than Q1. I believe Q1 had four referees, but Q2 definitely only had four, and they broke their coverage between four different quadrants. And oh man, it was not enough refs. You've got 10 people on the field all at once, potentially, disappearing, darting behind cover. The numbers just aren't there to catch everything. And it pains me to admit, but almost every round that I watched from the sidelines, I saw someone get tagged out, but not go out. And there was nothing I or the other people on the sidelines could do about it. A dispute took place right before the final round of the day, where a player alleged that they tagged an opponent off the break to start that round. The refs did not seem prepared to review what footage they had, but after some time, they did agree with the challenger and replayed the match. Immediately after, the same thing happened again. What troubled me was that after the dispute was settled, it seemed like no effort was made to address what caused the dispute. If people are debating tags on the break, maybe watch the breaks more closely? And given everything I've seen from the sidelines up to this point, I know there's a chance that tags are being missed. To the best of my knowledge, Q3 had five refs and Q4 had six. Yay, numbers are going up. But again, is it enough? 
I don't care if these are the best and brightest foam flinging referees in the world. You really should be targeting one ref per player, or at least enough to fully cover all the blind spots on the field, which requires extensive knowledge of said field. And a nitpick as well for the qualifiers, it would have been nice if the refs had matching shirts. I don't need an official Dart Zone Pro jersey, the ones they had for the tournament. It would be as simple as a bright yellow t-shirt. Something that makes them stand out and easily identifiable. Because during play, if I look over and see someone standing on the sidelines, I may not know if it's a referee, a bystander, or a coach from the other team. And if they call me out, and it's not an official ref, let's just say we had that problem in 2019. Avoid confusion with this one easy trick. It all came down to this. The top eight teams competing for fortune and glory. Live on YouTube. Despite all the ups and downs along the way, I knew if the tournament was a success, it would all have been worth it in the end. So how did it all go? Let me first address that I am a responsible adult. And as a responsible adult, I watched the entire four and a half hour Dart Zone Pro Tournament live stream on Sunday, July 17th. Hmm. A live stream was not required for this event, and a good one wasn't required for the event to be successful. However, it was fully integrated into the tournament. Dart Zone and Drac advertised this stream leading up to the event, so people knew they could catch it live without physically being there. And as someone who was unable to attend, I did appreciate that. So where did it all go wrong? Okay, on the positive, there were some nice pre-prepared slides and graphics that I'm probably borrowing for this video. The company clearly had a lot of the right equipment to make the stream possible, but it seemed like they didn't know what to capture when it came to the games themselves. Close-ups on players can be great, but not enough wide shots meant it was hard to actually follow a match. And oftentimes there'd be a big play happening and the camera of choice was just looking elsewhere. There was a drone that captured top-down footage, and I understand due to space constraints, it couldn't go high enough to capture the entire field. This was just one of the most useful angles that felt neglected because you could see the players moving and you could count how many were actually left. When the matches took place, you mostly couldn't hear anything from the field on the live stream, or hear the crowd cheering on the live stream. Actually, it was a lot of awkward silence, really. Initially, the two hosts, Drac and Brian, did offer a little bit of commentary, but I believe they had to stop because their mics were hooked up into the loudspeakers. So it appeared that that was fixed later, but even then there wasn't much. It often wasn't clear when a round ended, or in some cases, who even took that round. And sometimes the timer was on the screen, sometimes it wasn't, and sometimes the mics were on, and sometimes they weren't. But what happened between the matches to fill time? Commercials, of course. New products from Dart Zone, very relevant, and after the first round they were played, very repetitive. The most overlooked resource for all the downtime was the players. This live stream was a show, and in order to feel invested, I needed to care about the people who were playing. Before each match, there was a quick clip of each team with their loadouts filmed at FoamCon two days prior. It's my understanding that additional footage was captured at this time, but none of it was present in the stream and the commentators didn't provide much insight into the teams when it was their turn to play. The funny thing is, each team actually provided some useful info that could have filled time between rounds or during disputes. On Dart Zone's official blog, there are articles for the finalists. It shows the team photos from each qualifier and asks some simple questions like, how long have you been playing together? Where do you see the sport going in the future? What would you do with the prize money if you won? And these responses also could have been expanded upon by the commentators. But aside from whoever responded for each team, nowhere are the players actually listed. Each player did get a photo shoot, which was subsequently posted to Dart Zone's Instagram by team. I like that, and I like seeing all the players in their official jerseys. But the names and numbers are on the back. So again, I don't know who any of these people are, unless I know them personally. I was legitimately excited to watch the tournament live stream, but by the end of it, I just felt defeated and I wasn't even playing. Then the live stream disappeared from Dart Zone's YouTube channel, less than two days after airing. Initially, this didn't seem like a good sign, but I'm happy to say that by waiting to make this video, I can tell you that Dart Zone is posting individual match cuts on their channel. Some of the match footage is actually from different camera angles compared to the live stream. There's more commentary during and around the games that 
must have been taking place but was muted for the stream, and all the filler from the dispute screens and commercials has been removed. You might say this is cutting out the true experience and trying to hide what went wrong, but I for one am happy that they are putting effort into making these games worth watching, objectively better than the live stream. But we didn't actually need a live stream with 10 different camera angles and fancy graphics. And I know that because someone live streamed the entirety of Q3 from a corner, and it captured almost everything on the field. Shout out to Discord user Fish who live streamed the entirety of Q3. Maybe in the future, one additional angle from each side would capture the field in its entirety. Any commentary could be on the sidelines during the game, but in front of one of those cameras between the games. Simple stream logistics with minimal impact to the event itself might be the way to go. Because watching this qualifier stream was honestly all I really needed. The live stream did give people like me a chance to see what was happening in the moment. But even that limited information doesn't tell the full story. I said before that a successful stream was not necessary for the event to be considered a success. So how was the actual game? The tournament rules were supposed to be the same Senzone rule set used at each of the qualifiers, except when they weren't. For example, the field looked good, but it was the only one to not be entirely symmetrical, and for some reason teams didn't switch sides after a round. I also heard that teams did not get a chance to walk the field before the rules briefing, meaning there was basically no time to walk the entire field. And the layout was still a surprise that day. Why would you give teams the least amount of time at the highest stakes event? And on that note, let's talk about the blasters. The contentious point from day one. Your Dart Zone Pro only loadouts. Well, it's not what was originally promised. And I definitely didn't see this coming. June 23rd, 21 days before Q4 and 24 days before the tournament, Drac revealed the tournament loadouts that would be using Dart Zone's half-length bamboo darts only. Two Mark III's, two Mark 1.2's, one Mark II, and one Mark 2.1, to be divided among five players as the team see fit. Hey, hey wait a minute, what? When did they make a Mark 1.2 and a Mark 2.1? They were not available to the public yet, but they would be making up 50% of a team's loadout at the tournament. The first time that teams would get a chance to use these blasters was at a Dart Zone hosted social after Q4, and then they'd get to use them again three days later to compete. Oh, and all the attachments get to stay on during play. I think this was a huge mistake. I understand Dart Zone wanting to get their hot new blasters onto the field, and maybe thought the top 8 teams would be thrilled to be the first in the world to legitimately play with them. But did anyone think about how the players would actually feel? I said this earlier, it's already weird to not be bringing blasters that you know like the back of your hand. Trying out a Mark 1 through 3 for practice can certainly help, assuming the provided units at the event function as expected, but now teams have nothing to go off of for the new blasters. Drax follow-up reviews on the Mark 2.1 and the Mark 1.2 are a little helpful, but are not a substitute for holding the blasters yourself. And yet it really doesn't matter how great these blasters allegedly are. There was no reason to hide them away before the extended event weekend. Teams need to practice with their equipment if you expect them to play at their best and show off your products to their full potential. Even if a single sample unit was sent to each team's captain a month before the tournament, that would have been something. Though I guess that argument kind of falls apart for the last two teams that qualify only have two days before the actual tournament. Oops, maybe it just sucks for them. Or maybe we shouldn't use some of these pro foam flinging teams to test products in front of a live studio audience. Because once people actually had a chance to test fire all the tournament blasters at Dart Zone's social event Thursday night after Q4, something became very clear. I didn't hear too many notes on the Mark 2.1, but the Mark 1.2 was the talk of the town, and that talk was, wow, over 200 FPS. When it works, this was not a single blaster or a single user experience. A lot of people who wanted to test Dart Zone's brand new unreleased blaster were experiencing some concerning jams, some worse than others. But the beauty of the Mark I platform with its takedown pins and screws meant troubleshooting is easier than ever. And wouldn't you know it, this silly old mod community loves to troubleshoot blaster malfunctions. The MVP of the evening went to Silly Butts, who discovered the primary cause of jamming and a quick and easy solution to fixing it, a small plastic piece in the top of the shell that would sometimes catch on the ramrod when moved forward on priming. 
Snip, snip, peace is gone, you're back in business. So how did something like this get missed in testing? And are the tournament blasters going to receive this fix? Well, from what I saw and heard, it's pretty fair to say these changes were not implemented. Some claim that those who experienced Mark 1.2 jams were running them too hard and needed to not do that. I thought the Dart Zone Pro Blasters were meant to be the most competitive level blasters on the market, so much so that we're having a tournament to celebrate them. Also, some people were reporting issues when priming the Mark 1.2 slowly. Others were chalking up jams to a skill issue on particular users, which is a baffling stance to take knowing this was literally the first time people had them for testing. And if the top eight teams have skill issues, we probably need to reevaluate this whole tournament thing. Now, I do own a Dart Zone Pro Mark 1.2 that Dart Zone sent to me for review purposes. I have played around with it for over a month now and very recently used it at an event. It's their most powerful blaster to date, and I wish my complaints ended at the stock being flexible. But I too have experienced varying levels of jams comparable to what people at the tournament described. Of course, I was not one of the top eight teams, so there's a strong chance that I am too unskilled to operate this blaster. And yet my experiences hardly matter because we're talking about the players' experiences at the tournament. I choose to believe them when they're saying something is wrong with the blaster. Sorry, I know we were on the day of the tournament and then we backtracked a little bit, but the tournament only makes sense with this context. The blasters themselves were a huge part of it. On a surface level, the same loadouts meant that the most skilled team should prevail. But the Mark 1.2s literally jammed themselves out of the event. They ran out of spare Mark 1.2s, at least ones that were open out of a box. A Mark 3 was substituted at one point, and the rest didn't swap in a Mark 3 on the other team to rebalance loadouts. Like it or not, the Mark 1.2 will be forever tied to this event. The Dart Zone Pro Tournament logo is literally on the box, at least for now. I've given up on trying to track down all the rule discrepancies from the day of the tournament. Things like callouts from the sidelines changed for Q4 and the tournament. Somehow that led to people from outside the glass legally calling players on the field. No shade on the teams if that's allowed, but yikes, please fix that. The decision to make the tournament single elimination really should have been public knowledge earlier than the day prior or whenever teams found out it wasn't unreasonable to assume double elimination at that point. Okay, okay, but most of the time, blasters performed as expected, which meant the matches were fair, which meant the best teams won. All right, delicate claim to touch there, but here we go. I don't doubt the abilities of all teams present at the tournament, and like everyone else, I want the best teams to win. And the reality was the ref's inaccurate calls had a legitimate negative impact on certain teams. And once again, I do appreciate those who stepped in to volunteer their time and efforts. I recognize most of, if not all of the refs and know they have experience with foam flinging, which is why it pains me to say that if this was the best they could do, it wasn't enough. I counted eight referee jerseys, but from footage could only identify six on the field at a time. How many times do we need to say it? More eyes are needed. Especially, especially when we've reached what will be the most contentious games because of the prize money on the line. I don't want to go into specific examples of what I would consider missed calls, even if it's based on the footage that Dart Zone has shared themselves. It's not my intention to indirectly call anyone a cheater when, as I've stated before, it's the job of the refs to enforce their own rules. But I will share one questionable call because it only involves one person. Team Void had a player get tagged from behind cover in a really interesting way that fortunately was captured on camera from the spectator stands. But wait a minute, enhance. Did you see that? No, seriously, did, did you see the dart fly out of the magazine upon reloading and then the referees called the player out? But upon challenging this call, the footage you just saw was not allowed to be considered unless it was from one of the official cameras. And oops, they only have cameras on one side of the field and that was the only ref in the area. Call in the field stands, have a nice day. Yes, I'm salty about this because it is so incredibly dumb and only serves to poorly reflect on the event overall. 
every single player on the field can make a difference, which is why it is so important to get these calls right. Each team was allowed two disputes for the entire tournament, and a personal gripe here, why weren't they just called challenges instead? Dispute is so much more negative and argumentative, whereas a challenge comes across as less negative and more sportsmanlike. You can challenge calls in good faith versus coming in hot with a dispute. It's minor, it's not the issue at hand, but it did come to mind while staring at the dispute screen for 10 minutes straight, because those disputes slowed down the event to a crawl. And during that time, everyone had to wait with almost no context as to what was being reviewed. When the disputes were settled, zero justification was given for the decision. So that's no review footage for people to watch, uh, no explanation of what's being challenged, and no justification for the ruling. Thus spawned the infamous Dispute Zone Pro Tour logo. A good joke that even Dart Zone got in on. Very funny. But in actuality, this was incredibly frustrating and sowed more doubt that the event was being run fairly. And more on that fairness note, I don't doubt that refs were doing their best to make equal calls across all teams. But one angle that's hard to ignore is that the refs knew a lot of people playing that day. This was brought up as a potential conflict of interest in the qualifiers as well. I say again, I'm not accusing the refs of making biased calls because they have a friend on the field. What I am saying is that the last Foam Pro Tour in 2019 did shuffle some refs around for certain matches to avoid any chance of that happening. If that did happen here, I wasn't aware or even just for the optics of it all. Because like it or not, optics of appearing biased are not good for instilling confidence. The last Ragnar Oktoberfest actually tried third-party paintball refs to address this very issue. While most would agree there was still room for improvement, this was the best way to separate players from refs from others. Is there a cost associated with that? Yes. And that's why it makes sense to look into for larger scale tournaments or invitationals especially when cash prizes are on the line. I, for one, am more than happy to take some of the prize money and invest it into third-party referees if it strengthens the event overall. Of course, it's not my sponsorship money, that's just hypothetical. If you watch my videos, you know that I enjoy complaining about many topics and many blasters. This is not one of those circumstances. I wish I could be praising this event on every level, and recommending everyone to attend the next season. And I wish the new Pro Blasters that debuted in the tournament weren't such a point of contention. I know that putting on these events comes at a great personal cost to the organizers, financially and time-wise. And it takes a team to make it all come together so it also doesn't work without regular folks volunteering their time. But it also comes at a great personal cost to the attendees. They give up their time and use their own finances to attend these events. Even if that money doesn't directly go into the event itself, it's still money spent. The best organized games do not work if no one shows up to play, and players can't attend these events if none are organized. It's an important balance between the organizers and the attendees, and a lot of that balance rests on trust. For the 2022 Foam Pro Tour, many people felt unable to fully trust the game. In some cases, that meant players and teams simply didn't show up. I want to fully trust the next FPT season will make major improvements and learn so much from the qualifiers and tournament of this past season. I'd love to attend multiple qualifiers and play with multiple different teams, if I'm unable to qualify, and continue to see more local scenes and players. Because regardless of how successful these events were on their own, they did bring people together. They literally brought people together from around the world because of an interest in competitive blaster tag. The camaraderie was high, regardless of what happened on the field of play. More teams became aware of each other and now want to get better so they can play again. And more events are being planned by more small clubs with competitive games in mind. It is legitimately a great time to be interested in the growing sport, and I look forward to participating as well. And the Foam Pro Tour can continue to be a major part of that growth, but it needs to prove that it cares enough about its players to listen to their feedback. Some people will unnecessarily complain about every little detail and make it personal. That's inevitable with any competition and should be filtered out appropriately. Hopefully, this video doesn't come across as me complaining for the sake of complaining because I want the best possible version of this event and one that players, organizers, and sponsors can be proud of. If you weren't aware of this year's Foam Pro Tour or didn't pay too much attention to it, I hope this video gave you a little bit of insight. And whether you attended or not, 
I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments section down below. But please keep it respectful and civil down there, because at the end of the day, we are all human. Thank you everyone so much for watching. I'm done whining, and I'll see you next time.